Champions, I'm Amy Morgan, the feature writer at the Marriage Initiative, and I am so happy today to introduce Jeff Kemp. He's a marriage and fatherhood champion who speaks to a variety of groups, often using sports analogies learned in his 11-year career as a quarterback in the NFL. He founded and led the Seattle-based nonprofit Stronger Families for 18 years and has been a senior fellow for the Marriage and Family Initiative. For five years, Jeff and his wife Stacy served as vice president and catalyst at Family Life, where they also served as Weekend to Remember speakers. In 2015, he published the book Facing the Blitz, where he recounts life lessons learned both on and off the playing field. Jeff created resources, including a playbook through his ministry, Men Huddle, to help men cultivate deep friendships. Jeff serves on the board as an ambassador for Fatherhood Commission, an equipping organization that inspires leaders to champion fatherhood and God's design for dads. Jeff and Stacy have been married for 39 years, have four married sons and five grandchildren. Jeff, thanks so much for being here. Hey, you're welcome, Amy. Good to be with you. Thanks. And I, wow. I'll, I'll, my best to all of the um, passionate marriage champions and servants that are uh, watching and listening to this. Well, we are just so happy to have you. And when you say the word passionate, you are passionate about marriage. Can you tell us why? Well, God invented it. God said we should be excited about it and honor it. Hebrews 13, 4. Um, let marriage be valued, honored, esteemed, invested in, uh, treated as special by everybody. And the sexual part of marriage needs to be really protected and enjoyed in that one great commitment where it's safe and uh, flourishes and leads to multiplying, right? Being fruitful and multiplying uh, in marriage. So those are two reasons. The third reason is because uh, uh, I do love my wife. I've been married 39 years and it's been really hard, much harder than I thought. And we've gotten so much help over the years, which we're grateful for, uh, and found ourselves helping others with that help even before we were fixed, which we're still not fixed quote, but we're definitely strong and healthy and vibrant compared to a long time ago when we had high commitment, but much frustration. Um, I've just seen how important the journey of investing in marriage and enjoying the benefits of marriage and the family that it brings, um, praying for my kids, Christian spouses and seeing God bring that. Um, I'm excited about marriage from my personal experience, okay? Um, and then fourth, I'm a big picture guy. I was raised by Jack and Joanne Kemp, uh, who wanted to make America better and, and uh, knew that God's kingdom was the most important kingdom, but we had to steward this kingdom to make life better for people out of compassion. And uh, they understood, and I've understood that upstream of a lot of our problems, particularly the trouble that kids go through, is the breakdown of marriage. A, the loss of the vision and the lower marriage rate, and B, of course, high divorce rates, which is kind of what led to the lower uh, lower marriage rates. Um, so if you want to make life better for people, and if you want to improve the future 10, 20, 40 years from now, then you've got to invest in marriage. It's the epicenter strategy. So those are reasons that I'm passionate about it. Not to mention marriage reflects the most important thing in the world. God married us into his family as his bride. Um, and marriage is a metaphor for God's love for the church. So if we do bad, bad in marriage, if we're a bad advertisement for marriage, uh, we're a bad advertisement for God's love. And that's a shame because his love is absolutely outrageously awesome. And so is marriage done his way with his strength, empowering it. Well, and back when you were young married, you said it was it was kind of a, a, a difficult time, but you had some help and you learned some things that you now have kind of synthesized into what what some of the things you do and your passion for marriage and your resources. Can you talk a little bit about what you learned and uh, whether it was during the time with the NFL? I know you had some great mentors, um, some resources that you used and that have kind of shaped your your philosophy. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Um Hats off, to Gary, hats off to Gary Smalley, whose, whose humor uh, got through my thick skull to point me to God's blueprints for marriage, uh, and a ton of other folks 
who helped us, including mentor couples, Chuck and Barb Snyder, and role model couples, and uh, just a lot of great teaching. We've gotten a lot of help from Paul Tripp, a ton of help from Emerson, Emerson Egrich, and love and respect, and uh, all the Smalleys, Gary Thomas. Um, but these people all helped us a lot because they went back to the Bible and took God's blueprints. All right. Um, so what 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 have Jeff and Stacy learned that we either really, really believe in or pass on? Um, first of all, that commitment, because this is God's idea and his thing. And if he's big enough to raise Jesus from the dead, then he's big enough to make a marriage go for life, even if it's super hard and goes through some terrible crises and blitzes. So commitment, lifelong commitment, everyday commitment, never use the D word as a joke or otherwise. Okay. Uh, we're in this for life. If you are in it for life, then the only alternative to your frustration, trials, tribulations, struggles, differences, the traumas of your past, whatever, um, your offenses, the only option is to work harder. And working harder is an oxymoron. It basically means surrender yourself more to Jesus because he needs to change Jeff to change the marriage. I can't try to change Stacy. I can't just take my marriage into the marriage shop and say, fix my marriage, which is what people do going to a marriage retreat or a conference or to a counselor. Um, what they're really saying is fix her or fix him so I can get the marriage I want so I can be happy. That's a small minded, short term American consumer perspective on marriage. And we've been trained to be consumers. So number one is commitment. Commitment to God, because he's the only power that will make it work. And commitment to lifelong marriage, which says, I'm in this. So if we're hitting a rough spot, we got to go to him even more to work through it. Okay. Um, number two, um, my brain's having a fuzz. I, I just mentioned it. Um, the aspect of... Um, you talked about commitment. Yeah, I know. Commitment was number one. Uh, number two, I guess I'll say this. We see marriage as God uses it to conform us to the image of Christ. And if it was all super easy and you got the marriage you dreamt of uh, during your engagement when you thought it was all easy and, you know, um, dreamy, um, you wouldn't be challenged to become more humble, less self-focused to dig into your past and get some healing, uh, to surrender your life to Christ, to learn how to apologize first and forgive first, practice the one another's to your wife more importantly than to anyone else. Um, without marriage, you wouldn't learn to be patient and your character would stay the same. And we're supposed to be transformed and conformed to the image of Christ. Marriage will do it to you if you stick with it God's way. Well, so will parenting. That one, that, that one generates an awful lot of growth um, as well. So there's one of the great purposes for marriage uh, to be conformed to the image of Christ. Um, third, we have realized that God wants people that are very different together. Male and female is different enough. Okay. Good things come out of male and female. Biologically, that's where the next human is going to come from. That's cool. Uh, there's pleasure. That's cool. There's a bonding oxytocin in the chemical reaction uh, of that sexual intimacy combined with the relational and safe intimacy that makes both people actually want to have the sexual intimacy. Um, so this, this, this marriage is a very special conform you to Christ thing. And if the person isn't different, it's not going to have the synergy that God intends. Okay. Um, the be fruitful and multiply part um, and the teamwork. Stacy and I have been a great team during crisis, uh, during blitzes in life. I'd go away for six weeks every summer to training camp, and she'd run the show by herself with four kids, three during our football era. Um, boys at that. <laughs> boys at that, yeah. Um, when we hit a real hard spot, our differing personalities came together to make a better team than if we were both the same personality. So – I. I've, one of the, the big things that we've learned is we need to receive every aspect of our spouse as God's perfect design gift for us to make for a complementary team that brings the differences of male and female and her Enneagram one and my Enneagram seven, her ISTJ 
Jeff's ENFP. Um, if you don't know what all that mumbo jumbo means, it basically means she has got her act together, follows the rules, is organized, disciplined, straightforward, black and white, objective, analytical, uh, stops at stop signs and yellow lights. Um, and I am a freewheeling visionary who will mm, occasionally roll through a yellow light as it turns red, bend a few rules, but I'm visionary. I'm spontaneous. I'm impulsive. Um, it's funny. I'm the feeler in the family. She's the thinker in the family. Um, we are so different in every way that it bugs the heck out of us, which is where that <laughs> friction came. And the other problem is that we're both dominant leaders. She's like a 99 on that scale on, the, on a certain temperament analysis test, and I'm a 97. And that means that we're both thinking our way is right, but our way is different, which means friction. But guess what? Fabulous during crisis because we're committed. Okay. Secondly, today, I don't get as mad at her characteristics that want to correct me or remind me or um, say, hey, you could have done that better, um, which I used to bristle at thinking, gosh, that's persnickety. Well, she couldn't be the person that remembered to pick the kids up from school and handle a million details and pay our bills and make sure we don't go to jail for not handling our taxes right um, and got things fixed at the house if she didn't have some of that perfectionistic nature to her. OK, so I need to receive every part of Stacey with all those great gifts. So receiving your spouse fully, including the traits that rub on you and including the real weaknesses and flaws in them, because we're all such damaged goods. We're sinners. Uh, you know, some people have been abused in their childhood and that's created some wounds that don't play out very well towards you. Guess what? You have enough Jesus at disposal that you can be the healing agent to this spouse of yours. Um, and that's your ministry. And maybe that's a, a fourth message is that your marriage to each other is the first mission and goal in your life ahead of your kids, ahead of your church. If you're a pastor ahead of your career, if you're an entrepreneur ahead of your blog, if you're a female influencer, who's helping tons of other moms, but your marriage is getting a little anemic because you're so excited about the external. No, men, your number one mission is your marriage, not your fathering. And it will help your fathering. And it isn't your career to earn money and buy the house and pay for the vacations that, quote, you're blessing your wife with. Now, I think she wants to have her heart rich and full more than the bank account and the lifestyle. So our marriage is our mission. Husband to wife, wife to husband, husband and wife, two kids. It's the best part of your parenting. Okay. And then your marriage is meant to be a lighthouse mission to others. You got to show young couples around you that it's possible. Be real, be authentic, share your junk. Your mess is your message. As long as Jesus is the conclusion to it. But people need help. A, they need hope. And B, they need help. And your marriage can do that for folks. There, there was a, there was a, um, a, a couple that I, that are really good friends with. They were on the board at Stronger Families, Brian and Jamie Holman. They had a date night every week to invest in their marriage. Uh, drop the kids off at church on Wednesday, go to Starbucks, have a fun, come back an hour and 20 minutes later, pick up the kids. And one day he got to Starbucks before her. He's sitting in a big, comfy, cozy chair. Uh, she drives up a separate car. Um, busy family, um, comes in Starbucks and, uh, Jamie's like five eleven, long flowing, uh, you know, blondish hair. And she jumps into his lap hardly without any notice. And Brian's a former pro baseball player, pitcher. Uh, he catches her and he's kind of jokes around and goes, Hey, do I know you? And, uh, the guy sitting next to him at Starbucks says, dude, if you don't, you're a lucky guy. <laughs> well, they, they kid around, they joke, they have fun, they talk, they connect eyeball to eyeball. They're not on their phones. Uh, and then afterwards, they pick up another coffee from this, you know, 20 something female barista at the Starbucks counter. And uh, she goes, gosh, you guys look like you really are in love. I say, hey, we love being married to each other, but we work at it. We invest in it. And as she fills up their coffee to walk out, she goes, well, I just got to tell you, you give me hope. Young people today need hope. They need hope. They don't need lectures. 
They don't need principles. They don't need positions. They don't need debates on political issues of same-sex marriage or gender confusion. They need to see hope modeled. And hope is love, right? And the picture of Jesus' love on earth is marriage. Two very different people that bug the heck out of each other, putting their selfishness aside for the good of the team and the blessing of the other to love each other as they are. And guess what? When you do it that way, you both change. And man, you see those old couples been together 50 years. They're identical now. They both kind of have the same habits and patterns. They even look alike. You know, they're short and frumpy and they take on the same characteristics. Uh, I don't know if that'll ever happen with Stacy and me. I think heaven is where we'll um, be exactly the same, but you won't be short and frumpy in heaven. You'll be the best version of you. So <laughs> yes, I'm ready. And for we that. won't be married because Jesus will be enough, but um, people need hope. Your marriage is a mission. It's a lighthouse. That's how we got into the marriage movement. We were getting um, videos from Gary Smalley and watching them because we needed them. And then we started inviting our teammates on the Seahawks to come to our house for dessert. And I'd say, hey, man, we're learning some stuff about communication, which we need because we're so stinking different. Uh, this is a great video tonight on communications. You know, Enjoy dessert. Let's watch it. We can talk about it afterwards. That was about how highbrow and holy um, you know, Bible teacher oriented we were. We weren't. We were, we're learning. Come learn with us and do hospitality in the process because people love food and they love to come in your home and no one gets invited in one another's homes anymore. Um, so that's what we did. We ended up doing it with our neighbors. Our pastor said to us, hey, would you lead the young marrieds group at our church? And we said, sure, but why us? He said, because if you guys can stay married, anyone can. <laughs> That was his vote of confidence. That's such great inspiration, though, for our marriage champions, because a lot of them are people just like you guys who are just doing that. They they take one thing, they take one resource, and and like you said, invite a few people over for dessert. You know, start doing life together. You know, everyone leaves a, a legacy with their own marriage, and then reaching out how you can. And so, I love how you model that, and I love how you explain that. You then took it kind of the next step after the NFL. You. Uh, you uh, developed a stronger families that really touted the vision of premarital preparation and got churches and communities to agree. And yeah, the organization, it was a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. We started it in 93. Actually, Amy, um, focus on the family helped us get it going. I was a donor at first. And within the first year, they kind of were hoping I'd lead it. I was hoping my football career would continue, but God was and making that come to an end. And Stacy was excited to have me stay in Seattle and not bounce around the country for football. So we were there at the beginning, um, you know, from a teeny, you know, one and a half person budget. Um, it was called Washington Family Council. And then we morphed it from policy and culture issues into community strategies for marriage, which is why our name changed from Washington Family Council to Families Northwest to stronger families, which is what our end goal was. And yeah, I was there 18 years and, and we probably had 15 years or so of pursuing a strategy called community marriage agreements, which many times anchored a community marriage initiative. An initiative encompasses everything that you're doing to turn the tide on raising marriage rates, lowering divorce rates, and spreading the team and equipping the team, which is every single church, individual couples like us, um, some nonprofits, some businesses that scholarship couples for marriage enrichment and marriage preparation, uh, media that plays uh, pro bono ads that are positive and hopeful about marriage or fatherhood. Uh, that's a, a marriage initiative, but the agreement that we focused on was amongst the pastors and churches to kind of monopolize the market that they would prepare couples really well for marriage. You know, like we will marry no couple before their time. Julio and Ernest Gallo will sell no wine before it's time. Um, we're not just getting you a, a wedding. We want to give you a lifelong, healthy marriage. Which is exactly what all of our our marriage champions, that's exactly what we want. That's our heart's desire. Now let's pivot a little bit. Let's talk about your message now because you have a specific message that just has continued 
to be honed in and focused a little more same message, but you're really talking to the men now. You've got some great resources that you personally have, have created. So let's talk about your, your Jeff Kemp team, your men huddle, and talk about how, talk about that and how that can intersect with our marriage champions. Okay. Well, um, kind of the epicenter of what I'm doing is, is men huddle. All right. Um, and that's presented kind of as a verb that if you want to be a real and beneficial man, a real good man, you need to, first of all, receive your identity from your heavenly father. You don't do it on your own. You don't earn your identity. You receive it. That's the way Jesus received it. This is my son, my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. The chosen one. Listen to him. Jesus got all those things from his father, his identity as a son, his unconditional love, um, his approval and pleasure and delight from his dad, which we're all trying to get, right? What, what little boy and girl doesn't want to know that their daddy delights in them? And fourth, um, purpose, my why, that I belong. I have a role. I have a mission. Um, Jesus himself said, I can do nothing apart from my father. Wow, that's amazing. He said, I only do and say what my father gives me. Basically, Jesus lived by the receive principle. Okay. And when you start to think, oh, I'm a temple of the Holy Spirit, that means God lives in me and God downloads his will and his message and his strength through the Holy Spirit into me. And then he runs me kind of like a puppeteer runs a, a puppet, except God made us alive and likes to use our personality and our, our quirks and our strengths and gifts and our story. Um, in unique ways. So men huddle is about men gaining their identity in Christ as a son of a perfect father, no matter their father wound or father gap, which is high. The deficit of fatherhood is driving a ton of problems in this country. Um, and men are acting adolescent because of it. Okay. 60 year old men are acting adolescent, going for their third wife, you know, 30-year-old married men are acting adolescent and consuming porn and playing video games and not having sexual intimacy with their wife because they've been counterfeited by adolescent things because they don't know their identity as a beloved son of the king who's called to an amazing mission. So I don't have time to dally with that junk. And I have the power through God to escape that junk. But not if I avoid something crucial that men huddles all about teamwork, right? Yeah. Teamwork. And let's just, let's shrink that word down to a word that needs to be redef redefined friendship. Friendship today. Uh, is it a Facebook friend? Uh, you know, do I have a thousand friends, a thousand contacts? Uh, I have a lot of friends, but unless I'm in touch with a friend consistently and he knows all my secrets and I know their secrets, Maybe not all, but I, I would try to commit to that. But he knows my struggles and I know his. I know what's going on this week. I know about his marriage, um, job, attitude, finances. Unless I'm in touch regularly and sharing stuff and confidential and got, I have his back and he's got my back, um, then I am blind to my foibles, pride, and blind spots. And I am not as strong as God wants me to be because three is stronger than two and two is way stronger than one. Okay. Um, and your marriage isn't your best friend. A lot of guys say, who's your best? You ask guy, who's your best friend? Oh, my wife, dude. No, she is your amazing, outrageous, unique friend, lover, partner, but she's not your best friend. Your best friend is John who says, dude, you've been working too much, traveling all the time. Go home and love your wife. You're, you're looking at women too much. You need to get your eyes focused on her. Dude, I'm praying for you. You know, you need that friend, all right? He's your best friend to make you a better husband. You can't ask your wife to make you a better husband. So men huddle is about A, receive your identity, and B, let's practice the teamwork of friendship, deep, open, close, confidential, um, accountable, fun, iron sharpening iron, bearing burdens, confessing what you suck at, confessing what you're good at, um, confessing your sins. James 5, 16 says, confess your sins one to another. 
I don't think that means on Twitter. You know, <laughs> I don't think it means stand up in church and yell, hey, everybody, I, I looked at some woman's breast this week. No. Do that with your one or two best friends in your weekly huddle. OK. And a woman, um, I don't coach this as much, but a, a woman needs a couple best friends, too. You can't have 10. You, you need a couple. So men huddle is all about calling men to their identity in Christ the friendship, which is the way of Christ, the way of Jesus. He did. He changed the world with 12 guys that he turned into friends of him and each other. All right. Um, huddling. Uh, and then you get your purpose from God and you carry out relationships according to his blueprints with the help of your huddle, with the help of your team. So that's what men huddle is. And what do I do? I speak at men's conferences. I speak at men's retreats. I do Zooms. Um, I like to train leaders so they know how to help men's friendships take off. And frankly, I like to help churches so they don't just hold one-off events with some athlete speaking a testimony and the guys all get all pumped up and then they go off and live, live like Lone Rangers. And within six months, they're kind of falling back into sin patterns and Satan is shaming them. And then they isolate and get even worse. Uh, no, if we didn't have any budget or any men's pastor or any strategy or programs for men in the church, but the pastor modeled deep, authentic, committed friendship, and he talked about friendship and he actually trained in friendship. And their philosophy in that church was that we will help men have one or two deep friends, brothers. Guess what? You wouldn't need a men ministry because that would be your ministry. And there'd be better husbands, better dads, better singles. There'd more be more mentoring. There'd be better community service. They'd go into their job and fall for less compromise. Okay, they'd be affected by way less porn and online gaming and gambling and other vices, drinking, pot, whatever their escape, their self-medicating is. Why are they self-medicating? Because they're isolated. We don't self-medicate when we're hanging out with a friend. Hey, dude, just a minute. I got to go look at some porn. You, you don't say that when you're with your friend. You know? Well, and and I think you have you have a resource that you have created to help men do this because it sounds great, but it kind of sounds scary. And you've yeah. made it not scary. You have a this, this uh, little ten page PDF, uh, the Men Huddle Playbook um, for Level Five Friendship. I don't know if I really explained that before, but I'll real quickly um, make clear that there's you know people you know you call them eh, my friend. Uh, someone you see occasionally, maybe level three is a, a, a friend you see a lot, but you only talk about the usual stuff. You don't talk about really deep stuff. Um, but level four, you go deep with someone, man. You went through the army together. Um, you went through a challenge. You helped them through a, a marriage crisis, a loss of a child. Um, you hung out a bunch for a while, but you're not in touch regularly anymore. So you have, you have a lot of uh, closeness and depth at a time, but you're not the day-to-day -day brother that can help each other. Level five is you have consistent, committed, defined, open, transparent, vulnerable sharing and support to one another. Uh, that's a level five friend. And that's why you can't have 10 of them. Okay. Uh, so this is a game plan for how to start a friendship moving from a three to a four and from a four to a five. And if it's like, I can't explain this to my friend, you give him this and say, do you like this? And you go, um, then you say, cool, stay friends with him on level three or four and go find a guy that's ready for five, a level five. But if he understands this and you understand to it, handshake on it, know it's confidential, know it's safe. You got his back. I got my back. We're scheduling a time every week. We're each going to uh, be accountable for that. Let's, let's make our friendship sticky and vibrant and strong. Okay. And uh, I've, I got some other tools that just give you a little step or two to be a deeper friend, even if you're not throwing the word huddling or some official regular meeting together, because we need to kind of take baby steps before we get there. They can get the, this um, at uh, menhuddle.com. It's a free PDF download and they can text it to a friend, just text them menhuddle.com and the friend will see the pop-up when they go on there. And then all of a sudden you got a group of guys that have a kind of a, a playbook to sing off the same song sheet to mix metaphors. Um, so 
and I'll be iterating and, and you know improving it over time as I hear from churches and other guys, leaders, how, how's it working? But um, there's a spreading little network of guys that are huddling. There's always been men doing this. This is the way of Jesus. I didn't invent anything. I just kind of put a metaphor and some coaching tips to it. Can you tell us just a, another quick, quick minute, how men having that friendship could change a church, give some, cast some vision for our, for our marriage champions here. How could it change a church? How could it change a marriage? Well, when a man is not vested in his marriage because he's afraid of failing and he feels like I'm going to feel like a failure if I go to this marriage retreat or this marriage conference or go to that marriage counselor or that marriage intensive, uh, he's not vested. If one of the people isn't vested and stays uninvested, you're in trouble. Now, I'm not one of those who says it takes two to fix a marriage. It takes one person working on themselves, proving they're committed to the marriage, but not desperate, not codependent. It takes one person to spark God starting a revival that can rebuild a marriage. And if that's the wife or the husband, it doesn't matter. The husband or wife, you know, may catch on two months from now, a year from now, a year and a half from now, um, you just do what's right before God. One person can change a marriage. But we do know that if a husband shuts down and he gets interested in another woman because he's not able to make his marriage great with himself, with his wife, then it's very hard to repair a marriage when he's got one foot in the camp and another foot in some other camp. Okay. Uh, same thing applies if a woman gets into another relationship outside of marriage. But um, so you've got to give a man the chance to succeed when he's feeling like a failure and fearing failure. And Satan is converting God's message of guilt that you did a bad thing into shame, which is a label that you are a bad thing and you're hopeless. So don't go to church. You might as well just go wild and go your own way. Or if you go to church, don't be real, fake it. And don't develop a deep friendship where you let down your guard and tell someone what you really like. Because, man, they'll lose all respect for you and you'll lose that relationship. That's what shame does to us. Okay. You have an awful lot of men that are in that place in their church, in your church. And marriage conferences, marriage strategy, marriage enrichment, marriage this, marriage that isn't going to break through that defensive shell. Until he knows that it's safe to be amongst some other men that struggle with the same stuff and find out that the solution is different than be more like your wife, be more tender, be more girly, be, be more sensitive, um, fix yourself, do better. Come on, man up, be a better husband. Both ends of that message, be more like a girl or step up and be a real man, you idiot. Neither of those is going to work. He's got to be amongst some other men who say, dude, you and I are flawed. But guess what? God made us and he doesn't make junk. So there's something special in you. And just like the angel said to Gideon when he wasn't yet any courageous leader, he said, dude, you're a mighty man of valor. You're an amazing, victorious warrior. The Lord is with you. That's what God said to Gideon before he was that. Well, in the company of other men, and especially from your dad, ideally, or grandpa, you need to hear those words. But those words can only come from God because God's the one who makes you a man of valor because Jesus forgives all your sin, credits you with the righteousness of Christ, and then gives you the power to live up to it imperfectly, but a lot better than if you did it on your own through some Christian performance self-help effort. Okay? So every marriage movement, every church desperately needs men that are in deep friendship, mentoring one another, dropping their guard, being real, and calling each other up and supporting each other as friends week to week to week, not, you know, uh, quarterly breakfasts and once a year retreats, which give you a high goal. And then you go blow it and feel shame and go isolate. And then you self-medicate and maybe you, you even stupidly get adolescent and think some other woman is going to be the solution because your friend is remarried and he looks happy. And that's the enemy tricking the heck out of you. So if every church 
from the pulpit down, modeled deep, committed, consistent friendship like Jesus had with his guys, Peter, James, and John, even deeper than with the others. And then the men of the church picked that up and we made it normative and we invited new guys. Hey, you made any deep friends in this church yet? Come to lunch. Um, you and I might want to start meeting or maybe I can introduce you to another guy who you'll hit it off with. But uh, man, we need, we need a brother in our life every week. It makes us, makes us a better man, a better husband, better dad, it helps us handle all the junk at work. Um, I can't through, get through blitzes without my team. And I hope you got, I hope you got a good friend and I'll help, I'll help you find one or I'll be that. If every church had that, the nature of the men being connected to their father, their identity being strengthened, and their purpose and their relational capacity to empathize and love and serve and bond with their wife would go way up. And what a difference that would make. Oh, Jeff, you have been so inspirational and I, I could just sit here and listen to you forever, but I know our time has, has come to a conclusion. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. So it was great to be with you, Amy. And I, I would, I would say uh, if I can help you uh, get in touch with me at the, the website, menhuddle.com and at least download this, chew on it, share it with a couple of guys and adapt it, adjust it. It's just friendship. There's not like my formula is right, but I promise you, you can't avoid the way of Jesus and hope to thrive. Friendship is the way of Jesus. That is so inspirational. Thanks again. And, and Marriage Champions, if you'd like to know more, you know how to get a hold of Jeff. And you can always find us at marriageinitiative.org.